Today's second lesson is um, a vain attempt to summarize in just a few verses the message of the book of Job, which goes on for over 40 chapters. We're not going to be able to do that very well, but we'll, we'll take a glancing blow at it. And I would also commend to you in the week, in the days or weeks ahead, your own reading of this wonderful book from the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, from which we read now in the first and ch second chapters, let us hear now the word of God. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you have incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and Job will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a piece of pottery out to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Job's wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall I receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of our Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. The book of Job clearly is one of the Bible's richest and most complex books. First, it is a great work, a literary masterpiece which belongs with the classics of world literature such as Homer's Iliad and Milton's Paradise Lost. Throughout its chapters is interwoven a fascinating interplay between unsophisticated prose and poetry as delicate as it is powerful. But then Job is also a major work of theology. It offers the most extensive treatment of the problem of human suffering than you can, than you can find in all of Scripture. They say, misery loves company. Well, if that be the case and you're unhappy right now, this day, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that. And secondly, you have someone who understands and can feel your pain, and his name is Job. So I would turn you, I would steer you to reading the book of Job because he is one who truly knows how you feel in your pain and suffering. The book of Job tackles head-on the problem of undeserved suffering that there is undeserved suffering in the world despite the fact of an omnipotent and good God has given theologians fits forever. It is a charge routinely thrown into the face of us believers through the question, how could a good, all-powerful God 
allow evil to happen. Why doesn't your God, whom you routinely address, address as almighty, do something about the problems in this world, about the awful things that can and do happen to people, violence, famine, poverty, disease? Why doesn't your God do something about that? And each time that question is asked, we, we feel compelled to answer it. Now, there are really some acceptable answers to some of these questions, and they all come from the human side of the equation. Why did this happen to my loved one? And at the right point in time, the answer perhaps could be that, well, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Or why did my mother or my sister contract this awful cancer and at the right time the answer might be offered well she worked around chemicals as you remember for much of her life that we now know to be cancer causing but the minute we tried to explain tragedy from the divine side from the standpoint of God is the minute we get in trouble. It's like Pat Robertson saying that Katrina hit New Orleans because of the high percentage of gays who live in our city. Who knows the mind of God? What we do know about God is that God is love. The late William Sloan Coffin, for years the minister at Riverside Church in New York City, once preached a memorable sermon the very week after the tragic death of his son Alex in an automobile accident. In this sermon, he asserts that among the many things that can be said during such a horrible time as that which he, was, he and his family were undergoing, there is one thing that cannot be said, that God willed it. The night after Alex died, he said, I was sitting in the living room of my sister's house when the front door opened and in came a nice-looking middle-aged woman carrying about 18 quiches. When she saw me, she shook her head and then headed for the kitchen, saying sadly over her shoulder, I just don't understand the will of God. Instantly, I was up, he said, and in hot pursuit, swarming all over her. I'll say you don't, lady, he said. I knew the anger would do me good, Coffin said, and the instruction to her was long overdue, and I continued. Do you think it was the will of God, I said, that Alex never fixed that lousy windshield wiper of his, that he was probably driving too fast in such a storm, that he probably had had a couple of drinks too many? Do you think it's God's will that there are no streetlights along that stretch of road and no guardrail separating the road in Boston Harbor? For some reason, Coffin said, nothing infuriates me more than the incapacity of seemingly intelligent people to get it through their heads that God doesn't go around this world with his finger on triggers, his fist around knives, his hands on steering wheels. God is dead set against all unnatural deaths. Christ spent way too much time delivering people from paralysis and insanity and leprosy and muteness for us to think otherwise. Which is not to say, he says, that there are no nature-caused deaths, deaths that are untimely and slow and pain-ridden, which for that reason raises unanswerable questions. And even the specter of a cosmic sadist but violent deaths such as the one Alex died, to understand this is a piece of cake. As his younger brother put it simply, standing at the head of the casket at the funeral, you blew it, buddy, he said. You blew it. 
the one thing that should never be said when someone dies is it is the will of God. Never do we know enough to say this. My own consolation lies, he said, in knowing that it was not the will of God that Alex die, that when the waves closed over the sinking car, God's heart was the first of all hearts to break. Why is it that when awful things happen to our loved ones and to us, we want to know why God, why this, why him, why her, why us? And that's a natural question, and we have asked it, and we will continue to ask it, but don't go looking in the Word of God for the answers to that question because you're not going to find it. Even in the book of Job, some people think that's why Job was written, to answer that question of undeserved suffering. But if that's so, it does a pretty lousy job. Oh, sure, we're told at the outset why Job had had all this bad stuff happen to him, but the, but the explanation, in case you didn't hear it or in case you don't know about it, is so absurd as to be comical. That explanation, God and Satan make a bet, and Job is the pot. <laughs> God and Satan get into an argument over whether or not Job really loves God, and God says to Satan, go ahead and work your evil on innocent Job, and let's see what he does. Really? It's almost like Job is saying, you want an, ex you want an answer to this unanswerable question. Well, try this. God and Satan get in an argument and they bet that Job will go one way or the other. It's preposterous nonsense. It's like the book of Job is saying that the reason this tragedy struck is because Because, you know, as a kid, how your parents would give you that all the time? Why do I have to clean up my room? Why do I have to take out the trash? It's not fair. Because, they would say, I'm your parent and you're my son. Why? Why, God? Why this? Because I'm God and you're not. Because bad stuff, it just has a way of happening. Which is not an explanation, but the book of Job doesn't set out to offer us one. You and I don't have time in this sermon to go through the long story of Job and his troubles, but I will tell you that by the end of the book, what Job receives is not a satisfying, intellectually sensible explanation for his pain and trouble. Instead, what he gets is God. And that's what he needed. That's enough. It sets Job straight again. It properly reorients his relationship with God, which is God is God. And Job is not. Why God? Why this? Why now? We ask because I am God, God says, and you are not. You are human. Nothing less and certainly nothing more. But how often we forget this in this user-friendly day of worship. We want everything to be about us when it comes to modern religion, we want it to be convenient, we want it to be comfortable, we want worship to be affirming, we want God to take care of us in the way that we think we should be taken care of. We create God in our own image, but God will not be contained 
to that image. God is God. Only God is God. Completely free, completely autonomous. And yet, here's the thing. In God's autonomous freedom, the amazing thing is God reaches out to us and invites us to live in relationship with him. That's the message of the whole Bible, including Job. An all-powerful, all-loving God who invites us to dare to love, to be loved by that God. By the end of the story, Job receives something better than answers and an explanation. Job receives this God and all this God's holy otherness and love. We may be preoccupied with our suffering. Perhaps that is our situation today. Why is this happening to us? Whatever it may be. But the Bible doesn't seem to be very sympathetic. Instead, the Bible's concern is getting us to go outside ourselves, if even for a short while, and getting us to focus on loving God and neighbor. Suffering has happened, does happen, and will happen, not because of God, but because we're human. A friend in ministry tells of a woman in her church who was going through a difficult illness In the presence of her doctor, she said aloud, I just can't figure what I've done to deserve this sort of pain. Her doctor, dressing her wound at the time, muttered, What have you done? Well, in the first place, you were born. I hate to tell you, but in your pain right now, you're nobody special. Just one more person who got born and who right now, having enjoyed the fun of being a living person, now endures the pain of being a living person. I think Job is like that, theologically. So let's try this. Why is there suffering? Because we were born, born in pain at that. And we have good days and we have bad days. Sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we live long lives. Sometimes we live short lives. But that's not an injustice. It's just the way things are. William Willimon says, biblical writers such as the writer of Job had the intellectual ability to begin and end a discussion of something as perplexing as suffering or as the nature of God without narcissistically beginning and ending with themselves. Job ends then not with him reveling once again in his riches. Job ends with Job worshiping God. I had previously heard about you, he said, now I see you and I praise you. In other words, I am so grateful that you are God and I am not. So we come away not with satisfying answers to our big questions, but perhaps this morning with something bigger and better. A living God who is grander than the gods of our own design, a God who gave our lives a beginning and shall in the end bring our lives to an end all in love, a God who is with us and for us, now and forever. Amen.